Tonight's speaker, James Langdon has carved out a unique practice that fully integrates his design, curatorial, and editorial pursuits. It is also a practice that relies heavily on collaboration as a fundamental philosophy. As one of six directors of East Side Projects, which is an artist-run exhibition space dedicated to promoting cultural growth in its hometown of Birmingham, England, Langdon designs and edits many of the organization's publications, working with a rotating group of artists, illustrators, and writers to explore the institution's mission. James also works with a variety of cultural clients, such as Sternberg Press, Contemporary Art Museum Houston, Bookworks, and Lux in London. In 2013, Langdon founded the itinerant School for Design Fiction, which you'll hear about tonight, working with students to investigate the storytelling inherent in the design process and the emotions embedded within an artifact. He's also curated several exhibitions. I'm not sure exactly which ones he'll talk, tonight, talk about tonight, but um, some of these exhibitions include Arafin and Arafin, which celebrates the overlooked but highly influential British graphic designer, Tony Arafin, book show exploring the form of the book, and a restaging of Norman Potter's In Quest of Icarus. His writing has been featured in numerous journals, including Dot Dot Dot, F.R. David, Philip, and the Bulletins of the Serving Library, and he has been a guest lecturer at schools around the world, including Workplatz, Jan van Eyck Academy, and Kunstfach in Stockholm. In 2012, he was awarded the prestigious Inform International Award for Conceptual Design, presented by the GFZK in Germany, which celebrates practitioners who work and innovate in the space where art and design intersect. His work is deeply rooted in conceptual thinking, but as you'll see tonight, it's also just plain gorgeous. So please join me in welcoming James Langdon. Well, hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Emmett, for the introduction. Um, first of all, my, my thanks are due to the Walker and to the AIGA Minnesota for having me. Um, really excited to be here. Really great pleasure to be your guest, so thank you. Um, I prepared quite a lot to show you. Uh, the way that I like to do these presentations is to speak about the work as, as I normally would, um, as much as this format will allow. So it's quite conversational, um, meaning that at some points I'll, I'll probably go quite quickly through lots of images other points talking in, in more detail about particular things. Um, to begin, probably makes sense to say something about place. Um, this is Birmingham that you see, and somewhere in the middle there with the billboard is Eastside Projects, the space that Emmett mentioned. Um, we've been there since 2008. Um, I moved to Birmingham, though, in 2000. I studied, actually, as an artist in Coventry, a smaller um, city near Birmingham in the centre of England. Um, moved over, and I was working at a gallery called Icon. Um, I hadn't done any graphic design before this point, but while I was there, started getting interested and, and started to work as a designer in-house for that gallery. Um, I left there in 2004 to start my own practice, but in a way I, I see the founding of Eastside Projects in 2008 as the beginning or, or kind of where my practice as I see it now is really coming from. So as Emmett also mentioned, there's there's really strong sense with what I'm doing about being in relation to particular people. Um, and I, I think it it'll be good just to tell you a little bit about the other five of us who are running the space. The way that I actually met them all is by having designed books for them. So I'll just show you some of their work quickly. This is work by Simon and Tom Bloor. They're twin brothers. Um, they're based in Birmingham. Their work is kind of to do with childhood and, and um, play. Play as it's staged in urban space, you, you might say. Um, they're, they're involved quite a lot in... in or more recently in, in quite large public art commissions. This is a playground they did for a school in Bristol in England. And a book that I designed for them for the Whitechapel Gallery uh, 2013. Typeface that they drew.
So that's two of the six. Um, two of the six. Ruth Claxton here. Um, her work is is really visually quite extraordinary. She makes sculptural environments that are occupied by these kind of ghosted figures. They're they're found porcelain figurines that she modifies. She makes um, various appendages that that she attaches to them. Um, and this is quite an old book that I designed for Ruth, 2009, I think this was done. The figurines are always, they always have their heads and eyes particularly obscured. So we had the thought for this publication that the cover, we could photograph an, an unadorned figurine and then using foil blocking, um, actually kind of restage in a way, remake a piece of her work that was specific to the book. Celine Condorelli is someone that I am working a lot with at the moment. Um, this is a piece of very, very current piece of her work. It's called Swindelia, and this is it on show presently at Tenster Konsthalle in Stockholm. Um, Celine's work is really to do with this idea of support, um, which she articulates in a very broad sense, um, meaning framing or friendship or... Um, in relation to art, a, a very kind of broad idea of support. So in, in particular here, this is the Frederick Kiesler exhibition at Tenster. And Celine made this kind of curious sculptural um, figure, character. Um, and, and its function in the space is to kind of provide the essential elements that will support the exhibition. So attached to it is um, a fan, a light, a speaker and some kind of interpretive material, all kind of, maybe she'd be annoyed with me for saying kind of awkwardly, but, but just very, um, very, there's, you know, something quite odd in the visual, in, in the idea of making those supporting elements so um, explicit. A book that I made for Celine in 2009, um, really big project support structures, it, it kind of lays out the, the basic arguments that I was very um, quickly alluding to there. This is a really big book that we worked on for uh, almost two years. And the person that, that really initiated East, East Side Projects and, and brought the six of us together, his name is Gavin Wade, um, really important person in my practice. I first met Gavin, I think, in 2005. Um, this piece of work, something that we made together, it's part of Strategic Questions, is, a, is an ongoing series of projects that he's been um, commissioning, curating, I think since 2000. The format is um, one publication in response to uh, one of 40 questions that Buckminster Fuller uh, the American designer wrote in 1956 in a text called Design Strategy. Uh, his, his proposition was that if humanity could find the answer to these 40 questions, then um, our, our species would prosper on this planet. So this is one of the most important questions, evidently, has man a function in universe. The book is a um, really important moment for me in the sense that before this, the work I'd been doing as a designer was, was quite uh, minimal, you might say, or, or quite conventional in terms of art publication design, meaning that the, the display of artworks was quite faithful to their appearance in, in white wall galleries. So things shown on their own, photographed as naturalistically as possible and placed on the pages. But working together with Gavin, this is kind of a group exhibition in a book. So there are 12 artists who made work in response to the question of the title. Um, and the way, the way they're displayed is kind of everything in the same moment, everything on top of each other. So we work together. It's, it's quite a process of negotiation in a way with these individual artists to get their trust and consent to have their work presented in such kind of close proximity to other artists' work, a really kind of um, layered sensibility in a way, and an emphasis on the, the curatorial proposition ahead of the sensibility of any one artist being represented.
inside that book is a, a children's book with this little cast of characters that runs throughout. So that, that's the, the group of six of us. Um, as I say, the project was really brought together by Gavin and some of the main curatorial propositions are his that we've been kind of working through for this six years. One in particular follows on that, that work and that methodology, I suppose, that I just showed you in uh, Has Man a Function in Universe. So this is us. This is our space. Some drawings here made by uh, an artist, Carl Nowrot. This is a, an animation that, that I think just takes about a minute or so. I'm showing it to you because it demonstrates an idea that's particularly important to us, um, following on from that kind of layering in graphic space. The way that perhaps the most important curatorial philosophy at the gallery is a very particular idea about layering in time. So these various elements that you see appearing in the space are all the alterations that we've made um, since 2008 to this. It's a former um, cabinet maker's workshop in Eastside. Eastside's like the Birmingham's kind of post-industrial, you might say. There are lots of small workshops that still remain in this part of the city um, where we're based. This is the, the, the very beginning, 2008. I should have said during the animation that that kind of weird uh, structure in the background is a, is a sculpture by Heather and Ivan Morrison that was modified to become the office at Eastside Project. So in the beginning, we were all working in there. This photograph was taken by an artist, Stuart Whips. Um, he, since the very beginning of the project, has been documenting it photographically from seven fixed positions inside the space. So he designed camera mounts that are permanently uh, installed on the walls and periodically he'll mount his camera on and take a photograph from that position. Um, and I've been doing some work with the idea of um, colour separation, the kind of technical process of preparing an image for offset printing typically, um, meaning or um, practically in this case cyan, magenta, yellow and black as the four channels of a full colour printed image. Um, I'm showing you here the way that they combine to produce a f what we understand as a full colour image. Because we've got this um, this series of fixed position images, we started working with the idea of, of colour separation, not just in, in terms of colour, but also in terms of time. So um, what you see happening in these animations here is a kind of cycling through the different channels of a series of photographs taken in the space. So at any one moment, you, you're arriving at a four colour, fully resolved image, and then one by one changing out one channel for a photograph taken at a later point in time. In a way, it's, it's a kind of visualization of that idea of seeing the gallery program, not really about any one particular moment, but about a period of time and the way things accumulate in the space. So it reflects an idea that is, is quite counter to, to normal gallery practice and display practice in the sense that we don't have an idea that at the end of an exhibition, everything must be returned to the neutral white wall conditions. So um, each exhibition leaves a trace. Um, some artworks become permanent artworks. Some artists modify the space in certain ways that people coming after them uh, are forced to respond to. So here's some printed matter. I, uh, that's kind of my outline of, of the curatorial proposition. And I've got a series of examples that I'll go through quite quickly of ways in which I've, I've designed in, in relation to those ideas. I, I kind of see display as this thing that unites graphic design and exhibition design, and Eastside Projects is a really good vehicle for that thinking. So it's about trying to really embed the thought processes that go into the exhibition making and, and just use them also in the graphic design. So the way that's most consistently manifested is, it, is in the idea of overprinting. Um, this that I'm showing you is an announcement for 
an, an evolving exhibition that we did in 2011 called Narrative Show. And what's happening in, in this series of images, we, we started with, um, I, think, uh, I think our mailing list is, was at that moment 1,000 people. We started with 10,000 copies of this invitation printed in one color. We distributed a thousand of them, kept the 9,000 back, and then over the course of the exhibition, periodically overprinted them with new information. Um, go, just sort of going into more detail here of, of what that color separation and time separation process can do. It creates this kind of strangeness um, about your perception of time. So as, as I go here from the magenta channel of an image taken at one moment, adding the cyan channel of an image taken at another moment. It's almost as if you can kind of see back in time, you can see through bits of space. And then as you add other channels, parts of the image begin to resolve if you look at the left side and the top right corner, as nothing's changing in those bits of space. So the image is, is perfecting itself. But then in other bits of space where the activity is happening, you get this kind of layering and, and, and idea of everything happening at once again. The way these things were designed, the, the kind of methodology is that I, I tried not to anticipate the way I would occupy um, the space typographically. So these are quite large format. Sorry, I should be saying that. This is um, larger than A4, smaller than A3. Um, and just trying it at each moment to just think about what is there to be added and, and not anticipating, not planning. So that, in a way, that's my favorite kind of process where everything's very ad hoc and immediate and, and you're just responding to, to the existing conditions and you're not really sort of designing as planning. You know, you're, you're just working quite immediately in, in, in relation to things spatially and um, programmatically, I suppose. So we had to improvise ways of obscuring things that became irrelevant. That's a, that's a scan, you know, just to give you actually an idea of the, the texture of how that manifests itself. It, from, a, from a technical point of view, it's quite um, irritating, I suppose, for the printer to, to have these sheets of paper sitting around for months and then to have someone asking you to print and register them very precisely because of the paper is changing as the conditions in the workshop change and um, it's just, yeah, in a, in a way not such an appealing idea for the printer. Um, so I want to talk about, as time goes on, ways in which um, the decision making can be determined by this kind of material narrative and, and process narrative. So this thing on the left of the image is an envelope that was manufactured from the sheets left over of those um, overprints that I just showed you. Uh, and it, it's the size of it is determined by the biggest envelope that you could make um, from that particular format. And that determined the size of the next batch of announcements that we made um, that you see there on the right. And then they would be overprinted. So as time's gone on, I, I've tried to, to sort of explore the, the different ways that you can approach this process. So here there's a, um, a much, more, uh, much more obscuring of information, but relying on the fact that even if you print black over black, you still get something of, you, you still get show through because you get a denser black where those two inks combine. It's very sort of awkward and, and ugly, I realize, but t t I look at it and I, and I just sort of feel that that's a very comfortable way of designing for me. It feels very natural to see this thing on the left and, and just kind of visualize those little bits of space left over and, and imagine what can happen in those spaces. So these things are happening with big delays. So we would have printed a, a certain number of copies of, of what you see on the left, used some, and then others just kept stored on sheets that are not cut down. Um, then, and, and those sheets, 
the way it works now is that we kind of have lots of paper that's printed with various things in stock at our printers. And then at a particular moment, we would go to them with something that makes sense to overprint. So that paper just becomes very specific to us, you know, just something that's already Im embedded with one of our messages. But, um, yeah. So, so here's another example. These are A4 um, letter sheets on the left that some of which became used for a series of announcements here. Um, this is a really different way of thinking about the overprinting, trying to register very precisely uh, around the existing text. You can just see below the word screenings on the right, the trace left over of the previous um, printing. So that's kind of asking the printer again to be very precise and to match color very precisely, a, a Pantone mixed color that he mixed two months ago, mix it again so that it so that you can hardly see the difference of, of those two printings. Uh, and then again completely sort of covering the sheet with ink. But if you imagine what appears as a solid green there is actually a very um, washy variable green as it fits around what's previously been printed to try and give the impression of um, continuity. And then this was a particular moment where there was a very nice coincidence with, with what was happening in the gallery. This artist, Mike Nelson, um, I think in a way was not excited about that idea that I was describing to you of how everything's getting layered and, and there's um, traces of previous artists' work in relation to his work. So he proposed to just come in and concrete over. He built a complete concrete platform in the middle of the gallery that he would um, cite his work on and then at that moment in this process the printing process we I um, had this kind of double layer of white silk screen um, to create a fresh surface to print um, this image on more overprinting with the idea of zombies fingerprints. Um, these um, fingerprints were, were kind of derived from the exhibition of Chao Fei that, that's being talked about here in the upper left-hand corner. And then that kind of painterly um, mark making became a strand that was also used to visualize the following exhibitions, in this case, an exhibition by Bill Drummond. Um, other variations on, on what's possible with overprinting. We, d we don't typically do so many um, catalogues. Um, I'll, I'll explain why that is in a moment, but the publications we do are, are usually much more, much broader, you know, talking not just about one artist's work, but recently, this is really recent stuff that we, we have done a catalog for um, a show by Susan Phillips that was presented uh, late last year. Um, with the same philosophy that we would, this is an overprinting um, with documentation of a very kind of visually dynamic group show that came after Susan Phillips' exhibition. So you've got that kind of clash of aesthetics which can be quite perfectly um, represented through this process. So what you see in black is the first, the printing of the first publication and, and over that in two colors is new um, printing. Here it's just the idea of addition. Um, additional information can be added to something, or in this case something can be corrected. The economics of this are quite interesting. This is a, a press release, um, a four-page A5 document that we made a mistake on, um, but we kind of realized that actually it's the economics are the same as reprinting it to overprint it, apart from you already have the paper. So it's just cheaper and of course fits our aesthetic to just correct something in this way. Overprinting other people's stuff with our stuff. Um, a poster designed for an art festival in Birmingham, uh, designed by Abaca in London, and um, with the idea that the venues, each of the venues presenting the festival would be able to write their um, text into that white box 
and then overprinted by us in a kind of greedy way that you know expands out onto the sheet. Some posters, other visualizations of the idea of layering. These are not overprinted, um, but I've tried to kind of extend those aesthetics of layering um, into, into other work that even that isn't necessarily technically produced in that same way. And then printing uh, for very extended, um, overprinting with very extended periods of time in between. These are invites to Puppet Show, an exhibition that um, happened at Eastside in 2013 and then quite unexpectedly was later um, presented in another gallery in Blackpool in the north of England uh, as a touring show. Um, and just by coincidence, we had leftovers of those invitations that we were able to overprint. So really kind of perfect example of, of that idea of improvisation and not being able to foresee how something will uh, be used. Now, I said that we don't really do catalogues. Um, but what we have done consistently since we started is present things that we describe as users' manuals. They're publications that try to uh, articulate some of the ideas that we have, the ideas that I'm explaining to you now. Um, one very focused effort in that direction happened in 2011. Um, this thing called Public Evaluation Event. We, as, um, we're what's called a a national portfolio organization. So we're funded by the Arts Council in England. Um, and at this moment, three years after we opened, we had to do, as a matter of course, a, a report and a review of our activities. Um, and we decided to present that publicly as, a, as an event. Um, and for that, we made this publication, which had a very specific function at the event. It's, we called it draft four of our user's manual. It shows, um, had illustrations by Carl Narot, the artist that I mentioned before. Um, and it was used in relation to that event in a very um, particular way. So copies, I think maybe 3,000 copies of this book were printed. The way it's organized is as a compendium. So it, it, the, the contents is a list of verbs, a list of activities that happen in the space. And um, each text entry then kind of expands on, on those ideas and illustrates them. A very simple version of this was first printed for use at that public evaluation event. And then this copy that I'm showing you is one that I took notes on during the event with corrections and amendments, additions to that publication. That um, I'm showing them to you kind of stuck in the margins here and, and, and handwritten. And then they were incorporated editorially into, into the fifth draft, which was overprinted on that remaining um, paper. So everything that you see in blue is an addition to the original publication. OK. Um, Here's some work that's trying to project some of those um, ideas about, uh, the, in particular, the idea about not, there not being a neutral condition about layering and accumulation and adapting to existing conditions. These are some historical images of Birmingham. The, the beautiful building there is the original uh, library of Birmingham. Um, and this is a, a short time lapse that's showing the demolition of that building in the mid 1970s and the construction of this building uh, designed by a Birmingham architect, John Maiden. Um, not a well liked building. Um, actually, there's a good story of it that um, Prince Charles, Prince Charles um, said, apparently once described this building as looking like a space for incinerating books, not for storing them. <laughs> um, so the reason I'm showing you this is that, that in the city, there's an idea of um, each generation erasing things, aesthetics 
of the previous generation to redefine the urban space. Um, if you could look through that site, what you would see there today is this, which is the third library that's occupied um, one side of that public square. Uh, it opened in 2013, designed by Dutch arch architects Mekanu. Um, we had this feeling that there's something contrary there, there's something strange and something missing in a way in, in the fabric of the city because those three very contrasting aesthetics could coexist spatially. The three buildings that I showed you, none of them share the same footprint. So all three of those architectures could have remained um, and arguably made the city visually richer. So the most recent version of this document, the user's manual that we've produced, um, kind of is, the, uh, is thinking about projecting our philosophy into urban space. These are some models made by an amazing artist, Peter Nencini. We've collaborated quite a lot in the last few years. So I commissioned him with that kind of background premise that I just described to you. And we, um, he imagined a kind of visualization of how, first of all, the present philosophy of the city could be expressed. Um, uh, an architecture manifests itself and then is somehow flattened or removed. Um, a new foundation is laid and, an, and a new architecture is made in its place. Um, or a different idea, a kind of layered architecture which accumulates over time and has that kind of cutaway or, or the ability to look through the architecture and see the traces of what came before. Um, Peter's aesthetics obviously are, are kind of extraordinary. He's, he's bringing a lot to, to what this, um, the way in which this expands on that original architectural premise. He's an amazing artist, somebody who, uh, his natural habitat in a way is in the studio. You, he has huge collections of objects that he comes across and this, this interest in interfaces, you know, like how two unrelated objects might fit together in a particular way. What that work, so that's a model, but what that work became, it, it, was, it was made and photographed in that way to fit the format of this user's manual and kind of cast into a narrative by two characters from Birmingham's coat of arms, three actually. Uh, so in our coat of arms, we have our motto, which is forward, in a way does reflect on that idea of forgetting about the past and, and casting a new image. Um, the supporters are the engineer and the artist on the left and right. And then the third character that we imagined from, from the coat of arms is the hammer in the middle. So this, uh, th these are the, we characterized the artist and the engineer, Peter made these two characters and it became a children's book. So the most recent edition of our user's manual is a children's book in which those three characters kind of play out this narrative in relation to architectural space. I'm, I'm just showing you this to say that the, this is a show from 2009 about curtains. Um, all of these curtains from that show became, have been reused as our tablecloths, is why they appear in the background of these pictures. Okay, I've got this organized in, in roughly three bits. So that was Eastside Projects. This is a character called Ouija. Actually, his, his, his um, name is really WJ, the initials, but um, I, I worked with this character in, on a project that I was doing in Germany where, they, where WJ is Ouija, so I call him Ouija. Um, this is some work that Emmett alluded to and um, that I began in 2013. Uh, I was um, able to make a presentation of my work at the GFZ car, the Contemporary Art Museum in Leipzig in Germany, because they have this um, award um, presentation to designers whose work is 
um, in relation to contemporary art. And it's completely free the way in which you choose to represent yourself. And as a kind of the, the cluster of projects that I ended up developing for this um, just somehow became the idea of a school, beca became the format for it. I don't actually teach. I've done lots of visiting lecturing, but I've never sort of taught, taught permanently. In some ways, I think because I didn't, I wasn't educated as a designer, I'm kind of very alert or s somehow always interested in what a design education would be. So um, I used this opportunity to actually try and formulate um, my own practice in a didactic way. So um, the lecture program involves various artists and designers that I'd been working with or had ambitions to work with. Um, and I'll show you something about how this was originally presented at the museum and then what it's gone on to become. So Emmett and I have discovered that there's quite some ambiguity about what the term design fiction means. Um, my use of it will s sort of become apparent as I'm showing you this stuff, but one of the projects that, that is the, was in a way the beginning of this presentation in Leipzig is this one. Um, these two characters, on the right is Augustus Pugin. He was an English architect, um, very polemic architect. He began as a writer, excuse me. Um, in 1836, he published a book called Contrast, which really made his name. Um, he kind of severely criticised the uh, neoclassical architecture of his age and, and wrote in favour of a Gothic revival. He saw architecture really as, as a kind of biblical matter. Um, he, so, so he thought that Gothic architecture was really the true form of Christian architecture and that the neoclassical was a kind of degenerate, um, degraded, kind of horrible form. Um, this scenario, this drawing was made by Simon Manfield another great artist um, made for me. What's happening here is Pugin is having an argument with his bookbinder. The bookbinder is telling him, um, actually, I'll, I'll start this process going. The bookbinder is telling him that what he is asking for is impossible. What you see in this video is um, a first edition, an 1836 edition of Contrasts. Um, as these pages are turned, you'll, you'll see uh, we arrive at the plates section. So Pugin's argument was illustrated by a series of engravings. Here they come. Um, the, he, he meant them, I think, as almost kind of cartoonish illustrations. So the title of the book contrasts in each um, pairing of images, as you see them there, he's talking about a particular type of building um, and comparing a contemporary example with a Gothic example with a really sort of extremely biased perspective. But you might have noticed there's a kind of strangeness in the format that the images are always rotated and appearing on recto pages. I came to understand that the reason for that is the book was printed with these very um, heavy plates um, and the paper that it's printed on couldn't withstand printing on both sides. So there would be no possibility to have um, the two images offset facing each other on the facing pages and divided by the binding, which in a way is the kind of, to me, the natural um, presentation or display device for how such a binary argument would find its way into the binary form of a book. So in this project, um, it's a design fiction in a sense that, that it's reimagining um, the production of this book without that technical constraint. So Pugin's there arguing with his binder and saying, can you please um, get round this, this limitation and unbind all the books, turn the plates around and rebind them so that they actually appear properly on facing pages. So um, this is one of the elements that was shown at, um, in Leipzig. Uh, oh, we're only two minutes in, or four minutes. This lady is Katja Zwernman, um, 
a bookbinder based in Leipzig, and, and she's the person that, that did that work. So to me, that's kind of a, an, a, an understandable, communicable idea of design fiction, um, s somehow removing a particular condition that limits something. So I understand that design fiction, the term is usually used in the technology industry, and it's usually talking about the very far future. So trying to project a design situation away from the current restraints, um, technical restraints or social or conceptual restraints to sort of imagine what direction we might be going in speculatively. Um, my understanding of it is much more um, about now and it comes in particular from two sources. The first one of them is an English designer called Norman Potter. I'm going to talk more about him later. Um, and the second one is this stuff. So this is something that I um, presented in Leipzig. I found these two books uh, in about 2010 by the neuroscientist Michael Gazaniger. Um, he was working in the 50s and 60s um, on um, split brain patients. So before him, there was a Nobel Prize winning um, neuroscientist called Roger Sperry, and he'd done some really extraordinary early experiments with splitting the two hemispheres of the brains of mammals. And Michael Gazaniger was somebody who carried that work onwards into uh, human subjects. The reason, this, um, the reason this exists, this science was developed, is that in um, epilepsy sufferers, a seizure, an epileptic seizure is um, um, kind of made worse by a feedback effect between the two hemispheres of the brain. So um, a seizure might start in one side of the brain and then pass through this channel that you see here in the middle. It's called the corpus callosum. Um, and the experiments that they conducted with um, epilepsy sufferers was splitting the corpus callosum to see if it would actually um, control uh, the seizures suffered by um, patients with very severe epilepsy. So Michael Gazaniger's work was basically um, uh, conceiving a series of tests to try to understand on the patients who'd had this surgery what were the effects on their kind of cognitive behaviour, um, trying to understand which functions of the brain were localized to which hemisphere. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of telling this story quite quickly. There's obviously a lot more to it. But the discovery that they made, which is, um, which I was trying to present as in a way an interesting, important resource to designers, is this um, squiggle in the left hemisphere. They called it the interpreter. They basically discovered that there's a, there's a small section of the left hemisphere of your brain whose function it is to make narrative connections between the phenomena that you experience. So um, our, our identities, in a way, are determined by the, the function of the interpreter. It gives us our sense of continuity in daily life and the sense in which the kind of random phenomena and experiences that we have um, can be assimilated into our, identi our identities. Um, this work was shown in this way uh, with, a, with an OHP lecture. And, and the, the way his work has been typically understood is in relation to um, the law and free will. So it, so it has an application in, um, in the courts. In, in my view, it's actually extremely um, suggestive of, of the function of a designer, that, that in a way um, we have this thing happening in our brains that we are essentially the storytellers of the universe, that we have this evolutionary function of our brains which is narrative, meant to connect, make connections between phenomena. Okay, this is the next part of the Leipzig presentation. This was made, um, the museum has a uh, really extraordinary permanent installation of furniture by a German artist, Till Exit. And the title of it is Weltall Erde Mensch. And the title comes from this book, which was um, in the former DDR. 
this book was a kind of um, evolutionary history of the universe that was given to young people of a certain age. It's kind of um, a very progressive idea of natural history, but, but, but with a very kind of loaded political perspective. Um, and his work is throughout the museum. It's basically this collection of furniture that to a German, an East German person of a certain age is extremely suggestive of, of the former DDR, like a, a kind of um, a time warp in a way. This is the auditorium where our presentation happened. And Peter Nencini, who I worked with on the user's manual that I showed you, he and I wanted to um, make a presentation of that idea and, and try to um, expand on that expression of, of accumulation and, and the ad hoc and the improvisation um, as design strategies that, that emerged for me from that Eastside Projects work. So what we did is um, sort of set ourselves a storytelling task of, of the greatest possible duration. We took a book called Star Maker by an English author, Olaf Stapledon. Um, it's a really kind of amazing book that tells the entire history of the cosmos um, from the beginning, from the first civilization to the last. It's like, it's very um, surreal, but also kind of quite observational based on his, his observations about how different civilizations have um, succeeded each other in time. So it was a performance, me reading from the book and Peter model making live. I've got some, some animations here that's, that's kind of the best I can do to, to visualize that. Looking down, I saw through solid rock buried graveyards of vanished species. Down into the earth's core of iron. Through the strata into the eternal night where sun and stars were together. I saw civilization develop in isolated regions. Its simplistic environments hindered growth of mind. An ancient artifact was discovered. The advanced society which made it had left no other trace. Its message would take many thousands of years to spell itself out. A single designer could hardly A knowledge built up over generations. Thereby creating many distinct histories of the cosmos. Preserved like extinct creatures for scientific interest. <clears throat> that was Ivan Seal uh, who made that voiceover for me. So the last part of the Leipzig presentation was um, made by Celine Condorelli, whose work I showed you a bit in the beginning. Excuse me. Um, and she actually redesigned the gallery's cafe. Um, as a kind of actual manifestation of some of those design processes that um, we'd explored during the day. So she, re she made furniture, um, and in particular, a series of, of narrative objects um, that were um, that are the kind of permanent 
fixtures and fittings and ceramics used in the cafe. But on that evening, on the opening evening, had very particular narrative functions that were performed by various people in the space. Uh, the last part of that project was this book, which kind of um, documented that day, but but by not really a, not really as a kind of um, representation of it in space, but as a reimagining of it as a as a series of narratives in text. Wait, before I show this, I should really actually just say something about it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the after that, that project was done, I called it a school, but in a way, it was a very kind of one-dimensional presentation. It was very didactic, and it, and it wasn't really particularly participatory for the um, people who came. And after that, I started being asked more and more to actually present it as a workshop, um, which I've done in the last year a few times um, in Italy and um, Sweden and, and uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, and that work was really inspired by this video. I've got, it's a, just a two minute extract of it. And uh, um, it's a video by an artist, Sophia Hulton. Um, that work has a, has a sense of humour, obviously, and, and you, you get what's happening. It's a very um, kind of typical studio scene, an observation of a, a sequence of events. You pick up an apple, you drop it, it gets dirty, you clean it, you take a bite, you eat the apple, you put it in the bin. Um, in that whole work, it, it goes through a, a, a com kind of complete inventory of the possibilities of rearranging that sequence of events. It's really kind of mind expanding in a way that, that if you take away the expectation and, 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 our, and our sort of normal appreciation of causality, you know, what, what events, what actions follow one another naturally, you arrive at this really kind of amazing weirdness of, of reality. And so kind of in that, in that work, I saw a way of, of making a workshop um, about this idea of design fiction where um, it's not really, the work that we did is not really so much about designing, it's more about decoding. So looking at designed objects and, and trying to understand them in that, from that point of view as if they're kind of somewhere situated on one of those parallel strands of, of how 
actions or intentions, motivations might be manifested. I'll go through this bit quite quickly, actually. Um, so the workshop was done and alongside it, this publication was made as a workbook. So, so I would use this in the workshops, but it's also kind of in a way another expression and expansion of the work we were doing. These are photographs of work by an artist, Samara Scott. Um, these were made for specifically for this publication. She made these works kind of just live in, in the studio while we were photographing. Um, I commissioned her because her work has this very, um, this aesthetic that's kind of very hard to pin down. She, she, her things look a bit like sportswear, you know, they kind of have those weird like synthetic characters, but they're also obviously sculptural and, and kind of her use of colour is, is quite painterly. They're just very difficult to decipher objects. And they were placed in the book in relation to these found, these archival images by a Swiss artist, Batia Suter. Um, the kind of basic proposition editorially being how these different works can condition your reading of them. Um, the, the text was written by Francesco Pedralio and, and kind of tried to sort of, um, sort of get at that union somehow of, of um, these two works. Okay, part three. I think I can do it in 15. Um, you'll notice that I'm, I'm talking a lot about other people's work. It's quite natural for me to do that in a way. That, that's kind of how I see my own practice as a designer, that it's really always about a kind of handling, you know, that, that um, whether, this is not really particularly about working with artists, but that you're always sort of, sort of in relation to something, mediating something, taking it and framing it and passing it on, you know, it's kind of, it's a gesture, a, a gesture of display, like I show you something in my hand and the way I show it to you conditions how you understand it. So I, I, this last section I prepared is just really about going through that kind of agency and, and talking about a few relationships that um, people that I've worked with where I've done different things for them and, and we've we've ended up commissioning each other and, and, and those relationships become like tools, you know, that you become very familiar with someone's practice and when you work together, it, it brings another dimension to what you do and, and how you can explore that. Uh, this is a piece of work a typeface family called Lino. It was designed by Radim Peshko and Karl Narot. Karl Narot is the first person that I want to talk about in this way. Um, I'd, I wrote a text for this publication. It's quite old, maybe 2009. Um, I'd been writing text for Radim's website because English is not his first language and I would just kind of write texts for the description of his fonts, his type designer. Um, and just, you know, apparently through doing that, he and Carl thought I would be a good person to ask to write an essay for this publication. So that's how I first started working with Carl. And then he um, is also the person, I invited him to make those drawings, cutaway drawings and um, the things that I animated um, showing perspectives on Eastside projects. In 2012, we did an exhibition of his work um, at Eastside. Here's some images of that. The things that he makes in his own work are always, there are these kind of revolving um, processes. He makes templates quite often or, or tools that are drawing devices for making drawings. Um, and sometimes those drawings become sketches for typefaces. So his his production is, is always very cyclical, you know, that, that something that seems like it's the leftover of a stencil is actually on its way to becoming a model of an architecture or, or, um, or a typeface. Um, this year, no, last year, 2014, he did a second version of this exhibition in Seoul, where he lives in, in Korea. Um, and on that occasion, he asked me to write and design a little publication for him. This thing is tiny. 
it's really ridiculous to see it like this. It, it's like this big, you know, sort of A7 or whatever that is. Um, in a way, it's like it's one of the, my favorite things that I've ever done, not just in the control freak sense of having written and designed it, but just because it's really it really represents to me what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to engage as fully as possible with someone, try to really understand what their practice is, and then through writing or designing or publishing or editing somehow to find a good expression of that a good representation of that so with Carl he's not the kind of artist that you could really just write you know sort of press release about him um, his motivations and his aesthetics are, are kind of difficult for him to talk about in a way so we would we would have lots of Skype conversations in the process of making this book and what we eventually arrived at is the idea of some of these really kind of um, graphic characters from his typefaces became a series of characters in these in these short narratives that I wrote. So um, they're all talking about making processes. There's something completely indirect about it. Never writing, never writing the sentence. Carl Narot, you know, makes stencils, and then he mod. Never saying that. Always trying to find a way, trying to find uh, find a scenario and a, and a kind of voice that's also getting at that aspect of him that is so hard to, to write about, you know. So it's so in a way, it's they're just reference points, um, characters or or anecdotes that we might talk about when we're discussing his work. I'll read one. One evening, oh, I've never actually thought about how to read the... Um, I'm just going to say, oh, that's a bit unimaginative, but okay. One evening, O, oh, the curator of a provincial museum, notices a small ceramic urn in one of the museum's vitrines has been rotated on its spot. Puzzled but unperturbed, O oh, unlocks the vitrine and replaces the urn. The following day, O oh, sees that the urn has again been rotated to precisely the same angle. Arriving early at the museum on the third day, O stares at the ceramic for an hour, hoping to observe its rotation. Nothing appears to be happening. Perhaps it is rotating too slowly to see. Eventually, O hears a discordant rattling as the building's antiquated heating system switches on. The vibration quickly travels through the fabric of the building. This is uh, a new journal of contemporary art published out of Mexico City and edited by a young curator called Rodrigo Ortiz. He will laugh at my pronunciation of his name. Um, it's, I'm showing it to you because um, this first issue of it was um, edited around the theme of... Um, the, the, the studio as a musical cave is how he described it. So the issue looks at uh, the composer Conan Nancaro and um, a building that was designed for him to be his studio. Um, and then editorially combines a few things that expand on that idea. And one reference point for it was a novel called Correction by Thomas Bernhard, um, which sort of has this very um, sinister scenario that, that relates to um, Nancaro. So in that narrative, there's a, an architect who builds by hand this conical structure in the woods, um, and he's building it for his sister as a kind of offering. Um, and it ends in a very kind of menacing way when um, the process of making it has, has mentally unhinged him and the first time his sister visits the house, um, she, it, it, the shock of it kills her. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this to you because the, um, Carl made this painting for the cover, is why I'm saying this to you. And he, um, it fits this idea that I'm trying to express because he, the way I commissioned him was just giving him a very short, group of sentences from that narrative about the cone and the kind of being unhinged and the, 
the idea of a, of a mental architecture, you know, does this building really exist or is it just a kind of um, manifestation of this mental um, um, decay? In this publication um, is also evidence of another relationship of, of that nature, another, another collaboration that's become multidimensional. So the, um, it's with Celine Condorelli. I've shown you already some of her work. And what, what we're seeing here is the kind of um, back matter of the magazine, the adverts. So Celine's practice, as I've described to you, is really based on this, um, her definition of the idea of support. So instead of having all these generous institutions that sponsored the magazine um, use their own graphic design, um, we, we proposed to them that Celine would make selections of, of images of different notions of support from her archive. If you've, anyone who's worked as a, as a designer with, in relation to artists will know that no matter how good or bad an idea is, if an artist has the idea, it's, it's very likely to be accepted. There's a kind of code, you know, among um, curators that, that you should accept the ideas of artists. Um, so, so this is like a design strategy, you know, that, that if you present this idea of not having the adverts be badly designed by the sponsors, but actually having them be an artwork, it, you know, it, it all kind of works out. Um, these are some things then that I've made for Celine, um, the idea of sort of being a technician, um, actually artworks of her in this, uh, of hers, in this case, the wallpaper that you see in, in the background of this exhibition was made by me. <clears throat> and here a kind of, um, a print that I made that it, the status of it is that it's an artwork by her, but I made it and, and that's again, talking about the ways in which I most like working, I really identify with that, you know, that, that she is um, you know, sort of using me, using my um, skills, not really, but, you know, my kind of um, method, I suppose, or, or kind of way of visualising something. So we would have a, a conversation and then this is the result and it's a work by her, I'm just the person who executed it. Two things left. I'll do this one super quickly. Um, the exhibition that Emmett mentioned, it was called Arafin and Arafin. Um, this idea about working in relation to other people, it, it's my kind of present concern is, is what if they are dead people? You know, how to, um, how to be informed and influenced by people who are no longer alive. So Tony Arafin was a Pakistani-born um, London-based designer who really, in the late 80s and early 90s, made a massive impact on, on the art world in London, the publishing side of the art world, you would say, uh, because he brought a kind of art director's sensibility to, to catalogue design. Um, his aesthetics are like the aesthetics of um, magazines or, or music packaging, very free, very visual, um, not at all that kind of stuffy, conservative idea about art publishing. These are solo exhibition catalogues that he um, made covers for. Kind of weird proposition. Um, Another exhibition organised by me with a, with a um, that means something similar to me now, the idea of of research or exhibition making or writing as things that can directly um, um, help your decision making as a designer. So this is an exhibition um, that was made at Eastside Projects. It was called Book and Book Show. The idea was that the book and the exhibition were just one continuous platform. So um, this book, 
Um, and the exhibition, um, one isn't documenting the other. You know, there's a kind of um, just sense in which they're, they're both sites. The, the guy um, with the paper stuffed in his glasses at the beginning, he's Ulysses Carrion. That idea I was just saying to you about how your engagement with somebody in, in a kind of, um, as a researcher, I suppose you would say, can inform your work as a designer. So he, um, he was a, a Mexican artist and, and publisher. He ran, he started in 1975 a bookstore in Amsterdam, which is kind of thought of as the first international artist book store. It was called Other Books and So. Uh, and he also wrote very opinionated um, texts about artist books. I'm just going to read this one little extract in the bottom left. He says, A novel by a writer of genius or by a third-rate author is a book where nothing happens. What he means by that is he's talking about the book in a very formal sense, you know, the book as a format, that a book is a particular kind of object that contains a particular sequence of openings, and those openings are also spaces. It's bound by um, a process that kind of unites those spaces and pages, but also optically divides them when you see a pair of facing pages in that way. So his proposition was that that kind of object, the kind of object that a book is, has nothing to do with prose, nothing to do with narrative. So the convention, as we understand it as readers, where we just read pages of prose down the verso and then we jump the binding onto the recto and we read was kind of alien and unexpected to him. Um, so what that meant to me, or, or the way that I applied that thinking, this is a, a series of um, announcements that I made for Bookworks. They're an artist book publisher in London. Um, Again, a time machine was a kind of retrospective exhibition of 25 years of their activity. We made this series of announcements that came from that proposition of Ulysses Carrion. So each announcement is divided by, in this case, the fold. They're just four page folders. Um, and these two terms, back and forward, which appear on every um, edition that we made, uh, the back page we, we conceived it as a prompt to take material from their archive and the forward page we used to um, present new commissions by artists who were part of this project. It's a bit like I was saying about the idea of improvising around things that have been overprinted. This is another sense, another kind of thought as a design program, you know, that if, you, if you've decided to allocate space in this way, that conditions all the conversations that the editors have, it conditions how you handle the material and yeah, basically becomes like that sort of engine for the decision making in this process. Okay, really the last thing. Um, it's a shame to do this quickly. I'll just do it for like three minutes. Um, so yeah, thinking about dead people and um, how, how you handle that responsibility of trying to represent them. Um, the most extreme case that I've come across in my work is this man. He's Norman Potter. He's an English um, writer, designer, educator. Um, he's most known perhaps for this book, What is a Designer? Um, that's the first edition of it was published in 1968 or 69, uh, and it's kept in press in print today by Hyphen Press in London. Um, he was really, um, he began his career um, as a designer with a workshop in a small English village where he was making, um, he, you know, sort of being a designer as a service provider. So people would come to his workshop, um, say, uh, I need a table or I need a, my fence repairing. And he would respond to them, but according to his own um, kind of 
international, continental, modernist principles. So he made this very kind of incongruous beginning, in a way, of um, trying to be a modern, modernist designer um, in an English provincial context. Um, he went on to um, have this extraordinary opportunity in the early 60s to found a new design school in Bristol, which is in the west of England. Um, this is really like super condensed um, story. He, the reason that happened is that there was a big national review of design education in England, and lots of courses were closed down because they didn't meet the standards of this review. Um, so Norman Potter had been teaching at the RCA in London and was brought in to Bristol to found this new school, which he called the Construction School. Um, jumping ahead again, at the end of his career as a teacher, he, well, he, he'd really put that kind of same conviction um, into it that he did to his workshop. So he was a very, um, he had a very precise set of um, aesthetic values, you, you might say, um, which he instilled in his students. But for various reasons, that the, the kind of life of that course was troubled, and um, he uh, was involved in the protests that happened in 1968. They, they, uh, that was obviously an international phenomenon of student protests in that year, but in particular in the UK had a manifestation at uh, Hornsey School of Art in London, but also at Bristol, where Potter was teaching. So I'm doing this big research project about Norman Potter. These two pages that I'm showing you are from a play that he wrote at the end of his career, basically reflecting on his experiences as a teacher. Um, the, the play is cast into the, the narrative of the Greek myth of Icarus. Um, and Icarus uh, in the play represents the kind of um, spirit of student protest, kind of... Um, um, na naive in a way, but also uh, also um, s sort of spirited in in, in a sense. Um, mm, I really need to condense this now. But anyway, so we've we've yeah basically made two reproductions of this play. The set of the play is a uh, is what Potter called an isomorph. So he wrote the play on a typewriter. So the the form of the typewriter has to be manifest in the expression of the play. So that's the set as we um, built it for a performance in Amsterdam. The readers, the people who are performing in the play, are in the front, um, sitting on the typewriter spools. And then there's a, there's a projection screen, the paper, as it's being loaded into the typewriter. This is from a performance in Bristol. So where this ends is... Um, with me trying to find a way to um, work um, in a sense as a biographer. So I'm trying to make a biographer, a biography of, of Potter as a teacher, but he's someone whose um, um, values and, and kind of influence on his students is really monolithic in a way. And you imagine that if he was alive, he wouldn't really choose me as his biographer. So it's kind of a, um, this, this uh, trying to find ways to write about him that, are, that, that I can feel some commitment to, you know, feel that they're appropriate. So the way that I'm approaching it is writing about him, his work, the remains of his teaching as I find them now. So this last example is a house in France that he owned. Um, and was living in when he died, that basically um, is the first, this is the first subject that I've written about from that point of view um, as I find it now. So it contains the typewriter that um, was so important to his practice and that, that the play was based on. Um, and the way I'm trying to handle it is to talk about the idea of this is where they are now, you know, that, that in a way, the way that death sort of manifests itself in relation to someone's practice is it just 
closes everything and and things that are motivated in that particular way now are just decaying. So our, our idea is that this house, um, we might be able to transform it uh, into, a, into a residency space for people who are writing about design. Um, so kind of turn it into something, essentially. Huh. Oh, I really had to rush there, but that's the end. <laughs> Thanks. Please do ask questions, um, and um, can you wait for the microphone if you want to ask one? Oh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, there's a couple of questions, a couple of things I'd like to ask you about. Uh, first is. Um, it's an amazing idea of putting uh, time, working with time back and forth in print. And I'm wondering if you have uh, played with, in any way, sort of being able to do that uh, um, electronically uh, on the web or whatever and use maybe the future as well. Um, and then also I'd like to ask you about how you sort of, uh, you spoke from the beginning as if kind of an, a dream you just entered into the design world at the Eastside Projects. I wonder if you could sort of... Uh, Give us a little bit of your, uh, your left hemisphere narrative about how you, as an artist, you came to design. Mm. Okay, um, for the first question, I, I don't have much response, honestly. I, I haven't really done much work in electronic formats. Um, you know, not for any particular reason, but um, yeah. Uh, when I was, so when I was studying art, I was making paintings abstract paintings that were very process driven. I, I loved it. I was totally, you know, kind of dedicated to doing it for the three years that I was studying. But then at the end of it, just realized that it was um, not going anywhere, you know, that, that I, for a while, I went after I'd started working at a gallery, I would still go, to, you know, had a studio and would still go and try to make work of my own but just feeling like without the intensity of, of doing it every day and not having other commitments, it just goes so slow, you know, your development just, just you just get inertia with it. Um, yeah, and then, and then just started designing because I knew lots of artist friends um, who were doing things and um, I would just make, make stuff for them. And then, in a way, though, that, that just became more stimulating to me as a practice. The idea of being in response to something. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is this all gets a bit confused in the sense that I think the most interesting artists are also always working in response to something. You know, an interesting way to art, an interesting way to make art isn't really, you know, kind of in exile um, but for me that's why I, I like design processes I, I like to be asked questions you know and and have things that that are my concerns growing and being in relation to different people and ideas that are then the material that you can respond to those questions with Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on your own definition of design fiction. I mean, there's a lot of definitions, obviously, and I'm not sure if I want to speak for you, but it seemed like there was this notion that the, a gap in something provides the basis for a fiction to kind of fill the void mm. in your examples. Um, in the workshop that I did I would always introduce it with a, a quote from Norman Potter, actually. It goes something like, every artifact um, from painting to poem to chair to waste paper basket tells the total story of the culture that produced it. 
So um, the idea that contained in everything that's made are the or are, are everything all the evidence that you would need to extrapolate back to understand the the values of the society that produced that thing. So um, w what that represents to me is the idea that. As a designer, then, that process of how you decode something and the different um, directions that that can go in. So the reason I was showing the, the video of Sophia's is, is the idea that um, if, if you sort of tweak the, those, um, the causality in, in your reading of an object or a situation, it really sort of spirals um, mentally, you know, and, and that that's... That process, I think, is very stimulating for designers. In a way, I regret calling it that and using the, that term because it produces this confusion in, in the sense that um, with that presentation in Leipzig and with the workshop, it's that thing that I'm just saying in response to your question is really what it's about. So so I, I do think it, the, the reason I chose that, that, the reason I formulated it that way is that I did feel like there was, it was meaningful to criticise the way the term design fiction is used. Um, but, but I'm also not preoccupied with that, you know, in, in the sense that it is quite an obscure workshop and proposition and um, I, I don't really, I'm not really kind of suggesting that as, uh, you know, as a mainstream um, definition of that term. Hello. You have a very interesting holistic approach to collaboration. I was wondering if any of those ideals carry over to your teaching in workshops and presentations and such. Huh. Um, I feel very amateur um, as a teacher. I've never done any permanent. You know, you know, I've never. I said this already. Never been a you know sort of teacher somewhere. So in in a way, my teaching is very uncomplicated. You know, just like appearing with your stuff and n not doing paperwork and those things. Um, <clears throat> so, e yeah, in a way, that the stuff that I was showing, sort of as I reflect on it now, I think it, it's quite hard to represent the the school for design fiction work in in the sense that the things that I was showing were really made as um, they like teaching resources. You know, so so that performance of, of Peter and I modeling in relation to the star maker narrative and the way that appeared is animations in, in this thing. Um, th that's how, that's how I would most like to think of teaching. So, so it's like the way that project worked is, was I commissioned those people and, and cooperated with those people to make things that would be like the, the teaching resources of this imaginary school. And that's super appealing to me. And why, the reason why I was showing the neuroscience stuff, which is, is kind of, you know, really maddening to me that it's very hard. You could do a lecture for two hours about that. Um, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a shame to skim over it, but, but that's really, that's like the optimal idea of how to work for me in, in the sense that it's like visualizing. So I, I'm, I presume that Michael Gazaniga has no idea that I made that stuff about his work, but the idea of like sort of visualizing it um, very, you know, really concentrating, trying to, trying to um, draw out meanings from his work and represent his work, but also completely depart from the existing readings of his work um, that really appeals to me. So, I, yeah, I really like the idea of, of sort of ha having a design course where the curriculum is like that. It's sort of like ridiculous, but also very sincere, you know, like that we, it's a completely obscure thing to ask designers to pay attention to. But if you kind of do it with that sort of attention and, um, yeah, I think I, I I think that's still the thing that motivates me about that, about my sort of dream, abstract idea of what 
teaching design is. Do you have um, anyone that you would consider like a dream collaborator moving forward? Do you, are you interested in looking outside of the art world for more collaborations or is there one person that you'd really love to work with? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah um, no, not one person in particular, but yeah, definitely outside the art world. I really, um, yeah, I mean, just talking again about this neuroscience thing, I, I really found that very stimulating and and kind of the idea of of because the those paintings that i was showing that that were our um representation of that um split brain surgery that i really enjoyed that process because um you can go on youtube you know and watch michael gazaniga lecturing and he's got kind of powerpoint aesthetic thing um and i and and in a way the, it's really quite macabre, you know, the reality of what work, of what that work is. That it's it began with animal testing, uh, and then it's like, um, um, it's just very, you, you know, that there's a real kind of dark side to it. That that that's that our society considers that cost in the pursuit of of knowledge about our consciousness to be. Uh, cost that's worth paying um, so I didn't really show it but the rest of, of of our visualization of that is very kind of dark and that that being that agent between trying to represent very accurately that scientific work and then working with an artist and you know you know sort of emphasizing the things that you decide to emphasize that's perfect to me I really want to do that so yeah, so something of that nature that that's like, um, yeah, neuroscience or geology or something like that. Okay, I think um, we're going to see you upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>